What's up, Crypto Knights? Derek here again with you for another episode of KTF News. It is Friday, June 15th, 2018, and some really exciting news came through just last night while I was uh, getting ready to go to bed here in Bangkok, and I uh, just covering it for you today. And yes, it is true. The SEC has come out finally and made a statement about Ethereum. Uh, statements had already been made previously about Bitcoin, but they did go ahead and further confirm what we already knew, which is that Bitcoin is not a security. Bitcoin is very clearly a commodity. It doesn't meet any of the requirements of the Howey test that needs to be passed in order for something to be deemed a security under United States law. But there was some questions, uh, a little bit of doubt amongst many of us in the cryptocurrency space about whether Ethereum itself would actually meet any of those requirements of the Howey test. And if it did meet even a single one of those requirements, of course, it would be deemed a security under U.S. law. Now, I've talked about this previously with you. Uh, I've done videos about this in the past when we previously had uh, a little bit of rumors and speculation come out probably about a month ago now, maybe a little bit longer, we had rumors and speculation coming out that uh, the SEC and, and members of the CTFC and higher ups uh, in both organizations were meeting to determine whether Ethereum was a security or not. When that happened, uh, there was kind of a lot of uncertainty. No one was really sure about whether they actually did meet or not. It wasn't on a public calendar or uh, a meeting that was open to the public in any way. So it wasn't a hearing or anything that government would typically do on that front. So we don't really know if it even happened or not, but of course some discussions have been going on. We have seen the SEC recently uh, designate a czar of the uh, digital assets and cryptocurrency space. So the SEC is definitely starting to step up in the enforcement and really uh, you know, make sure that they have all the pieces in place that they need to have a proper regulatory team to attack uh, or you know, try to work with, depending on which way you look at it, uh, the different participants in this new and growing digital asset space. So this is good news because it's just like I said before, Ethereum does not in its current form qualify as a security in any way. Uh, it's very clearly not a security. So it's good to have a statement be made publicly. Now, this was William Hinman. He is the director of the Division of Corporation Finance at the SEC. And yesterday at the Yahoo Finance Summit, he explained that the at the summit that based on my understanding of the present state of Ether, the Ethereum network and its decentralized structure, current offers and sales of Ether are not securities transactions. Okay, so very clear. A statement has been made. Uh, this sets a legal framework for now both Bitcoin and Ethereum to be considered under United States law commodities, okay? And there's a huge difference between the way commodities and securities are regulated. Commodities have much, much less regulatory uh, environment or stipulations, you know, there, there's much less... Um, strict requirements for an exchange, or I should say a broker dealer operating in the trade of commodities, okay? And so the CTFC will, or CFTC, will uh, be the ones overseeing all commodities, not the SEC, okay? And that's a, a big deal here. Now, the reason why this is a big deal is because this means that there doesn't need to, at least for the case of Bitcoin or Ethereum, be any kind of registration under an SEC regulated exchange. That means uh, as far as Coinbase or you know, any of the other US exchanges are considered or concerned, they can trade in at least Bitcoin and Ethereum with absolute certainty that uh, they would not be labeled as securities. There's a pretty strong case to be made that there are many others that could not be labeled as securities, uh, you know, Monero, Litecoin, et cetera, any of these mineable, uh, pretty decentralized projects would not be considered securities under the Howey test. And I'll talk to you about that in just a moment about, you know, what the Howey test is, how it works, why something would get designated a security or not. But 
Uh, Hinman also hints that other cryptocurrencies or altcoins might one day no longer need securities regulations. He says over time, there may be other sufficiently decentralized networks and systems where regulating the tokens or coins that function on them as securities may not be required. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this when we go through the Howey test. And so this is, of course, great news. Uh, it did give some much, much needed breathing room or sigh of relief to the markets that have just been getting absolutely hammered over the past week. And uh, we did get a nice bounce off of this news. I think uh, I saw Ethereum up about 15% shortly after this. It was about uh, it was about 8% up over a 24-hour period at, at the close of a 24-hour period. Actually, we haven't closed quite yet. But it's it was up as high as about 15% just after the announcement. So we did get a nice bounce, uh, much, much needed pressure relief on the downward momentum of the market on the selling pressure that we've been seeing over this past week. And so that that was very nice to see. But of course, this brings up some new questions. And that is that we do have confirmation now that both Bitcoin and Ethereum will be treated under US law as commodities, which of course is awesome. Great news. We'll talk about the difference between a commodity and a security and how the Howey test works again in just a moment. But I first want to just let you know this doesn't uh, this doesn't take or let ICOs off the hook. As Jay Clayton has repeatedly said and clarified multiple times, he says that every ICO I've seen is a security. So while we do have confirmation now that Bitcoin and Ethereum are definitely going to be treated as commodities, we don't really know what they're going to be doing about the rest of these ICOs that have gone out there. I mean, there's literally thousands of projects. Um, you know, many of them have not, or I would say a good majority of them uh, specifically did not allow US citizens to participate in the pre-sales or in the public sales because they were worried about, you know, kind of the ambiguity of the law or just kind of like trying to operate in a gray area. Nobody wants to fall afoul of US securities regulations. The SEC is the world's preeminent securities uh, regulation board. And uh, they, they do go after people pretty hard if they see any kind of fraud or they really have any kind of reason to go after you. And they have what they call long arm jurisdiction, which means no matter where your company is registered, no matter where you operate, if you have sold even a pennies worth of uh, an unregistered security to a US citizen, you can be held completely liable under US law. And uh, that could end up with, you know, complete seizure of assets for the company. They could lose everything they raised and more, uh, pay for legal fees all the way up to the founders and the people behind it serving prison time uh, for being promoters of unregistered securities. So there's, there's huge, there's a huge price to pay if you fall a fail a fall, or a fall a foul of US securities laws. Okay. So we have seen that a large percentage of the ICOs out there have just said, screw it, we're not even going to accept Americans. We don't even want to deal with the possibility that this kind of a thing may go down. And that's probably the smart play. But it goes deeper than that because now what we're seeing or the question that we have to ask is after the ICO is done and many of these tokens go to all of these different exchanges, some of them operate in America, uh, many of them operate and currently have American customers. And even though the ICO is already done and they raise the funds and everything, the fact is if those projects would still be considered securities, then in order for them to be sold to Americans, they need to be sold on a SEC regulated and registered exchange only under SEC uh, securities guidelines. And of course, that's not happening right now. There are some SEC regulated exchanges that are in the works. Of course, T0 and Polymath are working on uh, the foundation for actually selling securities tokens. We've got the STO tokens, which are basically going to operate on top of the Ethereum network, but they're going to have baked in KYC and AML features that will make sure through code, uh, as code is law, that 
no tokens can be transferred to people that haven't already been whitelisted and are you know not legal or not legally able to receive or trade in those tokens okay so we have a lot of different things happening on that regard but as of now there's just still a lot of uh, uncertainty and it's going to continue for the time being the reality is there's no way that the SEC as one regulatory body in one country in the world, even though it is quite powerful, they are severely understaffed and under budget, or you know they don't have the budget that they need to move forward with the kind of enforcement that a lot of people are worried about. Okay, there's just no feasible way for the SEC to try to go after thousands of different ICOs at the same time and try to shut them down or make them return funds or, you know, try to find out if they've dealt with American customers. So it's just really a mess because this happened so fast. And of course, technology is already getting ahead of this, right? There's already decentralized exchanges popping up. There's already ways to do decentralized and kind of anonymous ICOs. The Komodo team is working on that. Uh, There's going to be all kinds of new technology and it's always ahead of where the regulators are at, okay? So they're kind of already fighting a losing battle here. And it's gonna be interesting to see where this goes. But I just want to bring all this to the forefront to let you know, this does provide some nice clarity on Bitcoin and Ethereum, though we already pretty much knew uh, based off of following what the law says that Ethereum was not a security. Bitcoin itself a long time ago has already been deemed a commodity and that has already been um, upheld in a court case in the United States of America. So that's already been, you know, been confirmed multiple times. But let's talk about why most of these ICOs are still likely going to be considered securities, or as Jay Clayton has said, the head of the SEC, the SEC chairman, he's already said on multiple times, on multiple occasions, that every ICO I've seen is a security. And that's a direct quote from him. And here's why, okay, here is the Howey test. And this is, again, it's ridiculous. I've talked about this many times. We're trying to fit this new technology, this revolutionary idea of, you know, being able to raise funds and do token sales uh, with people all around the world. And it's just amazing. It's beautiful what's happening with ICOs and how a free and open market is being created globally right in front of our eyes. But of course, government is going to do what government does, and that is hold back uh, progress because they, they want to get their piece of the pie. Okay. Ultimately they're going to tell us this is for our own good. It's for our own safety. I don't believe that, uh, for a second it's for the taxation. They need the money and they want the control. And this is a big threat to the legacy financial system. It's a big threat to wall street and to the traditional brokers and dealers and all the big legacy financial institutions that have so much power in our current system today. So they want to try to slow this down however they can. And that's kind of what's going on here. But so this test, the Howey test is from a 1939 ruling in the Supreme Court, and uh, it's still being used today. So this is how a the SEC determines whether something is a security and should be regulated under their, their guidelines. Okay, so it needs to hit one of actually, sorry, it needs to hit all four of uh, these specific traits. So it must be an investment of money. Of course, that's kind of goes without saying, uh, but there must be an expectation of profit. Now, here's where it gets pretty obvious, okay? It needs to be in a common enterprise, which means a common enterprise is is basically like a company, right? Uh, Each individual investor is investing in a common enterprise, which is overseeing the business. So that would be a corporation, you know, uh, an LLC, uh, an S Corp, whatever whatever kind of legally binding uh, corporate designation exists in a company. And the profit is to be generated by a third party. So it's through the efforts of the promoter. So you expect to get a profit from investing in this common enterprise. And it's through the effects of whatever that common enterprise does that you're going to get the profit. It's not any work that you do that's going to provide you with that profit. So let's talk specifically about Ethereum because you can very clearly see that Bitcoin, of course, doesn't meet this 
by any means, okay? There is no common enterprise. There is no Bitcoin company. Uh, we don't even know who, who Satoshi Nakamoto is. Of course, Satoshi doesn't have any control over the Bitcoin network, nor does any individual control the Bitcoin network. There's no Bitcoin company. Uh, there is no common enterprise, okay? And uh, you create profit in the system many different ways. Uh, the most common is through mining, uh, is, is the basic foundation is, is you mine Bitcoin and you generate Bitcoin with an expectation of a profit, but that is through your own efforts. It's not through the efforts of a promoter. You as an individual go out there and purchase the mining equipment. You use your capital, your energy, your time, your resources, and you generate whatever profit there is through your own efforts. So this is the same thing with Ethereum. And I want to look at Ethereum as it exists today versus uh, Ethereum as it was when it first came on the scene and when they held their first ICO, okay? And at that time, it was pretty likely that Ethereum was a security. I mean, it does meet all of those requirements at that time. When you, when you go back and look at the ICO that Ethereum held, uh, it was people investing money in a common enterprise, the Ethereum Foundation, um, with the expectation of profit. That kind of goes without saying, um, you know, the, the promoter, doesn't even have to specifically say that you can get a profit. Uh, so that's a, a key point here. They don't have to promise you a profit. It's just that the vast majority of people that would invest money in this Comet enterprise, they're coming from the mindset. They have the expectation that they would receive a profit from it. And that's pretty obvious. I mean, that goes without saying. If you want to try to fight the SEC on that, there may be, you know, the, the, this kind of thing can go to court. And someone could try to argue, well, there is no expectation of profit, but let's be honest. I mean, what are people investing in these ICOs for? It's pretty obvious. We're, we're expecting some sort of profit. And this is through the efforts of the promoter. Now, this is where it gets tricky, okay? Through the efforts of the promoter means that there is that central party, that common enterprise that is controlling uh, and, and the work that they do, the effort that they put in is going to have a large effect or the primary effect on whether people make a profit or not. And at the beginning, when Ethereum was just raising funds before the network was even launched, that's 100% accurate, okay? They were raising funds in order to be able to launch the Ethereum foundation, launch the Ethereum blockchain, get the whole thing moving. And so at that point, it was necessary for the efforts of the promoter or a third party for you to receive any profits. You as an individual investing, your work meant nothing at that point in time. So we look at Ethereum back then versus Ethereum now. So let's look at Ethereum now. It is, you're investing money um, and it gets trickier than this. There's not even an expectation of profit, okay? Because when you're buying Ethereum, what you're actually buying is, is a commodity. It's, it's digital gas. So it's interesting because some of the most common commodities that are traded, you know, physical commodities that are traded in the world are gold, silver, oil. Oil is a huge commodity. And Ether, the reason why they call it gas is because it is like digital gas, digital oil. When you're actually using Ethereum, you're using it as the gas necessary to run smart contracts on the global compute network that is Ethereum. So you don't even necessarily have to have an expectation of profit. Lots of people just want to run applications on top of the Ethereum network and you need to buy Ethereum and to use Ethereum to uh, generate and run those smart contracts. So there, you couldn't even clearly say that Ethereum only exists for an expectation of profit. So that's, that's a strike. Um, the common enterprise is also a strike now because less than 1% of all the Ethereum that's out there today is actually owned by the Ethereum Foundation now at this point. And also the Ethereum Foundation has very little control over the actual network. It's completely decentralized now. Uh, it's open source code. There are over 35,000 Ethereum nodes running in six continents all over the world. There's about 220,000 uh, Ethereum developers. There's almost 2,000 different apps running on the Ethereum network. So it's a global compute network, completely decentralized. Yes, Vitalik, um, as a figurehead, as the creator, does have some sway over the community. But legally speaking, 
there is no common enterprise running Ethereum any longer. Okay, so that's a strike as well. And now also through the efforts of the promoter is also a strike. It no longer is the case because now, again, same as Bitcoin, if you want to earn profit in the Ethereum network, you can do it through your own means. You mine Ethereum and you purchase the mining equipment, you pay for your electricity costs, you put in your time, your effort, your energy. On the other side, you can build applications on top of Ethereum and you can build your business around that. And you can then use the ether that you purchased to you know, convert into gas that allows you to run smart contracts, build your application, build your community, et cetera. So all of this is through your own efforts, okay? There's no more expectation of profit through uh, a common enterprise or through the efforts of a promoter. So this is why Ethereum very clearly is no longer a security. Now we need to compare that with ICOs, okay? And this is where it gets sticky and why Jay Clayton has com come out repeatedly and said that every ICO he, he's ever seen is a security. And here's the big reason why. They're all doing pre-sales and they're all raising money a common enterprise, a company is behind all of these ICOs and they're raising money, common enterprise. There's an expectation of a profit, whether no matter what kind of legal terms they put in the terms of agreement or whatever, it doesn't matter to the SEC. And this is what Jay Clayton has been saying over and over and over again, uh, which you know people have either been kind of ignoring or they've not really paid attention to. It doesn't matter what you put in your terms of service. If it if there is an expectation of profit, which it can be clearly seen by people investing in ICOs that uh, everyone's expecting a return on their investment. They're not buying the tokens for uh, use on a working platform. Now we'll talk about that in a second because if they were doing that, then it, it can kind of change, right? But there's an expectation of profit and it's through the efforts of the promoter, okay? And this is a big deal because when these ICOs are raising funds, they're doing it before their blockchain or their project even exists, okay? And that's the big key differentiator here. So there is a common enterprise, expectation of profit, and it is through the efforts of the promoters, through the efforts of the company holding the token sale, okay? Now, as um, Hinman said in his statements, some of these ICOs could actually down the line become truly decentralized and then no longer be securities, okay? That would mean that they could make their software open source and they could let the community basically take over the blockchain similar to what happened with Ethereum, right? There was a, um, a large distribution of mining and uh, through that process, the network became decentralized and there's no longer a central promoter. Uh, and so something could start off as a security and change to not being a security down the line. And there's many different ways that that can happen or might happen in these projects. So a lot of this is confusing, but uh, that goes to say in the state of Wyoming, they did actually pass laws about a utility token. Utility token is a new asset class. And one of the main foundations of this law is that if you're going to have a utility token, a true utility token must be usable for whatever that utility is at the time the token is purchased, okay? You can't do a pre-sale and sell something with the expectation that down the line, three months, six months, a year, or whatever it says on your roadmap, that this token is gonna have a utility. That would still very clearly fall under securities guidelines. It would, it would be a security because you're expecting something to happen down the line, okay? And that, that uh, is basically the core issue here. So if you're gonna sell a utility token, it must be redeemable immediately for whatever that utility token is used for. So for example, if your utility token is basically just a software license, which gives you access to, let's say, play a game on a blockchain, for example, it's a, a gaming token, and you can use that token to play games. Well, the, the second you hold your, your token sale or your token generation event or whatever you wanna call it, if you're gonna claim that it's a utility token, it must be usable the moment it's purchased. You can't do those pre-sales in advance. Uh, if you do that, then you are dealing with the security. And so there's a whole lot more that's gonna come from this. I just wanted to give you a real solid breakdown of where we're at and where we're going. And now here's the really exciting thing because I believe we are now on the verge of what I've talked about previously as 
potentially being the biggest catalyst for uh, an absolute explosion in the price of Bitcoin and now possibly Ethereum. And of course, other cryptocurrencies tend to follow behind the top two uh, and, you know, kind of ride the, the glory train <laughs> with Bitcoin and Ethereum. And that is a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, I believe that a Bitcoin ETF will be coming in 2018. I believe we will see it before the end of this year. And I believe the SEC is taking the appropriate steps that need to be taken first. They have now clearly stated um, that the that Bitcoin and Ethereum are not securities. So they uh, can they, they basically have met one of the big concerns of whether they can do an ETF or not, which is, is it a security? Is it a commodity? How do we actually designate this under US law? And as we speak, of course, we are seeing a lot of different people come up to address the issue of custodianship. Okay, custodianship is one of the big, big issues of whether we can have an, an ETF or not and why the SEC has actually rejected um, has actually rejected the idea of a Bitcoin ETF in the past is because of concerns over custodianship, right? And so that was a big topic at consensus this year. It's a big topic everywhere right now. We've also seen all of these different big banks um, are coming out and preparing to launch their own Bitcoin trading desks. And so I think all the pieces are coming into place. And so this article that I've got up on the screen right now, this is John Hyland, the global head of exchange traded products for Bitwise Asset Management, told ETF.com that he believes the Securities and Exchange Commission could soon approve a cryptocurrency ETF. Uh, Highland, who played a key role in developing the first commodity and oil ETFs in his role as CIO at United States Commodity Funds, hopes to introduce some of the first crypto ETFs. Last year, Bitwise opened a private cryptocurrency fund. Okay, so Highland was one of the, the first guys to bring uh, commodity and oil ETFs to the United States. And he believes with pretty high certainty that in either... He says he pegs the chance for action in 2018 at 20%, in 2019 at 60%, and after 2019, 20%. So sometime in the next year, roughly, we should see a cryptocurrency, specifically a, a Bitcoin ETF. And I believe, of course, Bitcoin will be the first. And uh, yeah, this is, this is just one of those things that we're looking for um, what's going to be the big catalyst that could really bring us to the next great bull run, uh, the next really um, big influx of retail investors. Because of course, what happened in December and January, the mass hysteria was all of these retail investors getting into Bitcoin, getting into cryptocurrencies for the first time. And many of them have left now because they bought high and sold low. They did the noob stuff you're not supposed to do. They got scared. They didn't know what they were buying. They bought off hype. It's very common, unfortunately. But Again, that was just a very small part of the retail market because most people didn't know how to do it. It's confusing. Now, when a Bitcoin ETF is out there, you will be able to, as an American, be able to call any broker, deal with any broker, Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, whatever broker you have, you'll be able to call them on the phone or just log into their website and click a couple buttons and you will own whatever amount of Bitcoin you've purchased through your ETF. And they will have a custodian service where they actually store your private keys on your behalf and uh, just make it super easy. And those are the kind of things that are going to make it possible for um, all kinds of funds and uh, specifically uh, retirement funds and, and uh, those kind of more strictly regulated and uh, safety. They're, they're very, uh, they've got to be very risk adverse. Uh, they can only take specific risks. And right now, cryptocurrencies are simply too risky. So all the pieces are falling in place. This is really exciting news. I wanted to jump on and give you a breakdown of where I think we're going. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are here to stay. They are commodities that makes trading in them so much easier, so much more straightforward as far as uh, the American side of it goes. And the big thing is that whatever the SEC decides in America is often just kind of considered or, or very often just copied in other countries because it is such a highly respected regulatory um, agency 
around the world. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, I want to say thanks for checking this out and uh, please leave me your comments below. Tell me what you think. Are you excited about Bitcoin and Ethereum being labeled as commodities? What do you think about the future of ICOs? Do you think you know this is gonna make it easier or harder to hold ICOs going forward? Do you think there's gonna be some more regulation crackdowns on some of these different ICOs? And uh, yeah, tell me what you think about the possibility of Bitcoin and Ethereum ETFs. And as always, please go ahead and give it a thumbs up, smash that like button, smash that subscribe button, and also click the notification bell so you never miss another video that we upload on our channel. And with that, I will see you again soon. Peace.